right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Says Pop Online, Says Magazine, and Pipeline of CRM. Joining you, as usual, from San Diego. I'm going to say San Diego. Well, it pretty much is San Diego right now because we're heading into heat advisories and, uh, and a heat wave this weekend. So, ah, uh, lucky you. Well, it's going to be pretty, pretty hot. Uh, and we normally have a nice kind of temperature here. This is going to be a little excessive. Today I'm joined by Arif Anis, who is in London, England. How are you doing, Arif? Hi, uh, John. I'm good. No heat wave there, though, right? All right. No, no sun in the last ten days. <laughs> and Arif is an acclaimed writer and storyteller. He's uh, published many books: "I'm Possible," "The Man in the Arena," "Follow Your Dreams," and you have a new book coming out that's about crisis, particularly about the pandemic, called "Made in Crisis." Right, Arif? Yes, indeed. I can't wait. Yes, hoping yeah. to get it out in October. That's fantastic. Okay, so, um, I mean, obviously, I was going to say what prompted you to write this book, but it's quite obvious what prompted you to write this book. There's a lot of, uh, you know, we're in the middle of, of a global pandemic and a shared experience that, that uh, probably few of us have ever experienced anything like it before. And different people are reacting to it in different ways. So what's, what's the premise of the book? That is actually how to survive and the sky crashes on your head. And we recently experienced it. Uh, it we, the crisis management is something that we are all familiar. It is much more popular, it's much more common. Mm -hmm. But the crisis leadership, um, actually we witnessed in the last uh, four to six months of time um, that the crisis leadership is one of the weakest link in terms of global leadership. Uh, and we, we witnessed the failure of leaders and leaders, those leaders who were considered mighty uh, in terms of their, their influence and in terms of their vision. And in the last, say, since January, February 2020, we all have been um, part of those turbulent times. So, I mean, this whole thing intrigued me uh, that why we were caught so unawares, why we couldn't see it coming. And then when we saw it coming, why we still denied it and until it really, really shook us really bad. And as we understand the whole world, in, in a, we are in a global recession now. So this prompted the very book. And it's interesting, as you said, I mean, why we didn't see it coming because um, I kind of met, I've been in the States for 23 years. And when I look back on that period, uh, I came here during the dot com. We, then we had the dot com implosion. Mm -hmm. Soon after right. that, with 9-11, then we had the financial crisis, now you COVID. Right. So it's not, right. like, right. it's not like these earth-shattering crises aren't coming along at fairly regular intervals. Correct. Actually, uh, almost in every decade, we, we had something happening. And that somehow defined our kind of distorted that particular, de particular decade, in fact. And it seems that this one probably, it, it can probably last, or, uh, last longer than a decade. Uh, yeah, but why do, you, why do you think it is then, though, that leaders are not prepared for crises or don't know how to react to them, given the fact that they're inevitable that they'll come along? Very interesting, because uh, when we, uh, we actually studied some uh, 58 leaders uh, from the first world and the second world and the third world, and we, we kept analyzing, and while uh, you are uh, uh, sitting in the States, so the, the failure of... Uh, um, the first world leaders, somehow the United States be became an epitome of uh, uh, the crisis, in fact. Um, this particular crisis that somehow dodged the bullets and it, it imploded. And it is still actually uh, defining the United States of America to a large extent in, in, in the 2020s. What we figured out that um, the most successful leaders who managed to um, combat uh, this particular crisis, fight it off, and uh, managed to actually turn something around, they turn out to be females. Mm. So female leaders, which was, which was a big, um, I wouldn't say surprise, but given the particular leadership theories and the paradigm, as we understand, uh, they were least expected. But somehow, as we understand, from Jacinda Ardern to uh, Germany's chancellor to Taiwan's president to most of those females. Now, females acted decisively and they acted decisively with the muscle of compassion. Now, this is something that is exactly not happening when we look at the Boris Johnson of the United Kingdom or the Donald Trumps of, 
of the um, United States of America or, or from say South American and or for example even Iran or, or, the, or the Iron Man of um, uh, the Russia. So we found out that the males somehow and most of the males, these males we're talking about, they're so full of themselves, vainglorious, so, so pumped up, in fact, by their own uh, mightiness, that they somehow ignored. So they lacked compassion, and they also lacked decisiveness. These two things would turn around the countries, particularly led by the female leaders, exactly these countries were badly hit, where these uh, male counterparts were um, leading the show. So what can then, what, what can we learn from that in terms of, of uh, how to prepare for ourselves, apart from replacing all the male leaders with female leaders, what, what else can we do to prepare better? Uh, I guess that the preparation is that we, we somehow, as we understand, we are spending trillions of dollars in, in defense spendings, um, while the, those wars never happen, and we, we, we hope that those wars would never happen, but somehow, uh, our our expenditure on 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 health and particularly the technology and the education that is relevant with health uh, that is barely missing. Like this is not one of the priorities because that is probably not that hot. It's, it it doesn't um, help someone win elections as 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 does say different war mongling or saber rattling or other kind of stuff. So uh, one thing which which particularly became obvious that is the mis prioritized aspects of leadership. Uh, leaders, uh, they were um, winning elections and at the same time garnering support uh, for the wrong reasons. Uh, they were not addressing the, the heart of the matter. And the heart of the matter, as we understand, in most of those countries, they were struck by, by the pandemic. Uh, most of those who lost their lives, they are the lower part of the strata, um, lower part of the society those who have been kind of ignored out of the mainstream. And that's what that needs to be the priority, uh, along with the compassion and along with the decisiveness. Uh, and then, so, I mean, and when you take this down a level then to, you know, from world leaders down to, you know, people and business owners and small business owners, how can, how can they weather these crises? Because, you know, the, on when you have a you know a huge large company or when a country or whatever i mean you've got lots of people around you and stuff like to help you with when it comes down to small businesses who've been hit really hard you know everywhere across the globe you know here in the us really hit hard how do you, how do you get your business set up to uh, survive this and come out and thrive and thrive when when all of this is over um well we we actually researched um, on this particular side and we found out some of the winners during these, the time of the downturn, we found out um, Zoom's uh, uh, Yuan, Eric Yuan, in fact, as one of the winners, we found out um, Jeff Bezos, uh, one of the winners, we found out um, uh, Tesla's, um, and then this um, uh, space projects uh, um, uh, chief executive uh, is one of the winners. So these are the people actually who, who were actually, who were riding the tech wave so we found out that if, uh, if uh, you are tax savvy and you are managing it in a manner that you, it's kind of future costing, but you, you dis decide quickly, you, when, when this pandemic hit, in fact, in, in January and February, the most of the world, the most of the chief executives of the smaller and medium enterprises, they were, first of all, denying that it's going to happen, then they were too late to react, then it had struck them really bad. So what we, what we found out that those chief executives who, who managed to take advantage of the, these tumultuous times, these are those who were quick on their toes. They, they managed to just, uh, uh, as we say, never waste a crisis. So they managed to hang on to that, made quick decisions, um, uh, made, made quick decisions from the bird angle, from the strategic aspects, allocated their workforce in a typical manner, uh, shifted their workforce to the online mode and, and, and drove this entire change uh, through the technology. So we can clearly understand that tech aspect is one aspect, no big enterprise can afford missing it out because that, that miss can actually uh, take you down.
Yeah, and there's so many, I mean, and I talk to a lot of very, you know, small business owners and even solopreneurs and people like that who have, who have managed to pivot their businesses, maybe their management consultants, maybe their speaker, whatever, pivot that to online quite successfully. Yeah. And then we saw here in the US, we saw um, companies being able to pivot to making ventilators for hospitals like companies who'd never done that before so nice. i mean i think that level of agility is quite is quite amazing and i guess it's 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 a it's a mindset really isn't it when you something like this hits to whether you think yes okay i can pivot absolutely um fine well, we actually uh, proposed that there is um a, a framework which we uh, call price uh, p r i c e uh, so P is for uh, promise, R is uh, for risk, I is for innovation, and C is for change, and E is for empowerment. So after studying all those organizations and, and the successful people, uh, successful people in, in the downturn times, we figured out that this framework was employed somehow. They, were, they, were, they promised their people, their shareholders, their stakeholders, um, when they actually found themselves um, facing this heat, they, they promised the leader actually, they, they acted faster, they promised that they would manage to, um, manage to rescue them. And then they, it, it took a lot of huge effort and they managed to do that. Not only this, the risks were there. Risks are always there, whether you, whether you take them, whether you avoid them, um, they, they are there. So these are the people actually who, who approach them head on but cautiously, they were not mm -hmm. suicidal. Uh, at the same time, they were ready to change. And as you mentioned, they changed themselves just on the go. They didn't really waste any, any, any day without uh, moving um, towards something better that can actually uh, prove an insurance policy in, in these tough times. And then they implemented the change on the go while empowering their teams. Uh, so in all those organizations, whether they were like Zoom um, success stories are those they are more more um, human resource was mm -hmm. employed. They they empowered their people. They they let them make make the decisions and they they express their confidence. So this framework we we, we uh, figured out that it's very useful um, in in most of those organizations um, who manage to turn around the tide. Yeah, and I think going forward, I think that's a big lesson that people are learning coming out of this because. I mean, once upon a time, people were doing like three and five year plans, and then they were doing like, you know, two year plan, and then they were doing one. And now people are looking at increments of 30, 60, 90 days, you know, because there's so much uncertainty. But I think right. it's really showing up the fact that unless you're agile and nimble, and you have good digital processes set up to be able to support this, and as you say, empower your people, if you have all that, you're in pretty good shape to take it, you know, to, to come out of this well. If you're not, if you're kind of old style and traditional and you're like trying, trying to turn the Titanic on, on a dime, oh, yeah. it's not going to work out so well. Correct, correct. Absolutely. Mind you, turning, I mean, the turning the Titanic might have been a good idea, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, probably that was too late uh, yeah. to, to turn it anywhere. So yes, agility um, and agility based on the tech processes. Mm -hmm. uh, so wherever, uh, it was more manual, more HR driven, more human driven. It, it slowed down the entire thing because say you can't travel, you can't communicate, you can't, uh, the human touch actually, that, that was the missing element. So agility driven by the tech, that really nailed it. Yeah, and it's funny you're just saying about the human element. It's, it's, I think it's, a, it's amazing how people have also learned how to communicate and connect using virtual means and, uh, and I guess the, the big worry for a lot of companies is, oh, when people go virtual, you know, you lose all of this culture and stuff. I mean, we've run a virtual company out of choice for eight years now, I think it is, wow. strategically. Pretty ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually discovered, to be honest, and I'll tell you, interestingly enough, I, I always call myself the reformed smoker of virtual working because when I ran companies in the past, I couldn't stand people working from home. I hated, wanted everybody in the office and thought the only way you can build a culture and really, you know, productivity. Oh, yeah, yeah. And now I've discovered that not only can you, in some businesses, can you do it, it's more effective, you get more done. And here's the interesting thing, you actually sometimes develop deeper connections with people virtually than, you know, you did when they were sitting right beside you. 
Absolutely. We actually, uh, we, uh, I mean, in, in the speaking circuits and mm. uh, it almost felt like that this whole thing is over uh, in, in February, March. Mm -hmm. But then we, then we once again led by a different um, advancement in, in, in the tech and um, we experienced then um, uh, Tony Robbins' first one uh, in April, in fact, that was mm -hmm. something it, it seemed as it would never happen. And then it, it exploded. Actually, it uh, uh, listed, registered double presence than ever. Well, say around 23,000 people from more than 128 countries. And the experience was simply, simply mind blowing. Uh, we never believed into the power of tech that might that yeah. it would overpower your, your physical presence. So you are here once the headset is there, you are in that virtual zone and you're hundred percent concentrated. And we found out that mindfully, it was even more, the presence was meant even better, uh, say better compared to the presence, uh, physical presence. And there's so many different variables actually uh, hovering over you and, and distracting you. So this was a game changer. And then we, we just um, jumped into this, um, um, let's say Hoshi bang and then, mm -hmm. uh, the results are simply fascinating. And as you mentioned, you were already, already ahead of the curve. And I'm sure uh, all those companies like yours who are doing it better, they, 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 they are not going to reap the rewards for that. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And, and uh, to your point uh, about the, you know, the virtual events and that I did, I spoke to somebody recently up in LA who has, who was, who was a, um, they were a booking agency, you know, where they booked um, events at different venues and all of that. They have actually launched a whole platform now to do virtual concerts and all of that kind of thing. So it's that, it's that exactly what you're talking about. It's that agility and, and innovation coming out of it and being able to think about how can we create an experience that's even better. And, and to your point, um, one of the concerts they, they did recently said, okay, if this was an in-person concert, okay, maybe there would have been 10 to 15,000 people in the stadium. And maybe if you'd had, you know, five different concerts, where they had like a half a million people. Wow. Um, wow. You know? Wow. I think this, this, is, um, this is going to become the choice now. Uh, otherwise, we might have taken another 10, 20 years. Uh, because due to the old school, right, the real presence, the human touch, like that's, that seems like, and most of us would never do this as a choice, as you said, that once you were doing it. Yeah. So now once we are into it, we, we, we are already seeing how fascinating and how fabulous this entire thing is. And it, it cuts down the costs, it makes things easy, and it gets, things, gets us all going. So uh, I guess that the, this new norm is going to define the next next decade and and other thing on a passing note. Yeah, and I think I mean for all the and obviously it's uh, you know it's sad and, and and terrible you know the loss of life and the destruction of business and all of this. But on the other side, if you want to look for some kind of silver lining, maybe it has accelerated change that needed to happen anyway, and it's accelerated it, and maybe it's going to make for a more interesting and innovative world going forward. Absolutely. Um, when, we, when we did all this uh, research for a good three, four months of time, we found out that pandemics for the last now 700 years to 700 to 1,000 years, they have definitely, when it comes to the human loss, the lives lost, the hundreds of millions and millions sometimes. That was, that was that's something uh, that always remains uh, mm -hmm. the darker aspect of it. But then every pandemic from, say, from the 13th century to, to the 20th century and now the 21st century, it impacted lives. It challenged us to, um, to become better than who we have been, in fact. And it challenged us to change. And that change was not something more. It was, it was kind of a, a change that we pushed to change. And it, it challenged us in a manner that we, we thought better, we thought faster. And, and most of... Uh, most of uh, the discoveries and innovations in the last 700 years, we owe them to, uh, to pandemics and such kind of with a crisis. Uh, we, we've, uh, there's, a, there's a punchline that states that we are all ordinary people until a crisis finds us. So um, this is something that, um, that gets the best out of us. It gets sometimes the worst out of it as well. But I think when we look back, we, we found that the best part is, is bigger than, than the worst part. 
Yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't agree more, Arif, and I think that's a, a great, that's a perfect note to, to end on. Um, listen, the book is called uh, Made in Crisis, and it comes out when, did you say? The 10th of October. 10th of October, so I would uh, encourage people to look out for that. Uh, timely, a timely work indeed. Um, all of Arif's information will be below this video, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Well, we are, I'm, uh, I'm a writer um, and I work in um, as an executive coach um, to the leaders. Most of uh, most of them are coached. There are Fortune 500 and Fortune 100 leaders of big corporations. So I mainly work with them on the strategy aspects um, and uh, how they can steer their big ship towards um, that that's, that's a win-in for them and how, how they can align their teams uh, to that purpose. Uh, so a work on purpose, a work on leadership, um, and getting the best out of uh, human productivity. That's fantastic. Well, listen, thanks again, Arif. It's a, a pleasure talking with you. I'm very in interesting, and the book sounds, you know, fascinating. Um, my name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah.